What up? Hey, uh, hopefully the wind chimes won't uh, drive us crazy today. Old people in those wind chimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, I, you know, I put videos out about longevity, blue zones, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, then my YouTube feed gets inundated with stuff from like Rhonda Patrick, Peter Attia, about VO2 max and lifespan. So originally I was just going to come out with like, uh, you know, kind of like calling bullshit on that video, but uh, I'm glad I gave it a couple weeks and kind of like marinated on that a little bit. I don't know about these wind chimes. I gave it a couple weeks to marinate on it and I'm glad that I did. I've softened a little bit. Um, I think there's some validity to it, but what was driving me crazy about it is that VO2 max is calculated by, you know, the divisor is kilograms. So um, size is a factor in that calculation. Obviously, the, the lower a person's size, the greater the longevity. And uh, including in, in height, you know, of course, there's a linear relationship between height and weight. And, um, you know, there's two factors. If you're going to put height and weight as a factor into it, well, yeah, of course, uh, there's going to be a strong association with longer lifespan with those who have a better score on a VO2 max. Um, so to me, it's, it's kind of bogus. You need to remove the weight as a factor uh, or you're not going to be able to tell what fitness, uh, how much fitness is contributing to that lifespan extension. So... But having said that, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting to the age where I'm considering life insurance for the first time. And what I like about the life insurance industry is that unlike a lot of nutrition and health and medicine, uh, you know, those, the, the science that comes out of those fields uh, is often very polluted, very corrupt, very inaccurate, because they're trying to create some kind of claim that they can attach to a certain product so that they can market that product and sell it to people with that claim. And that claim often is uh, greatly exaggerated, right? Um, with life insurance, the industry, their profits depend on their accuracy. And so getting the science right and predicting uh, the odds of a person's lifespan is really important to them um, so that they know what to price the life insurance at. For somebody who's getting term life insurance um, that expires at age 65, which is probably what I would be looking at. So, um, yeah, uh, what do they do? What do they measure? Well, they measure height and weight, <laughs> and then they measure uh, blood pressure and resting heart rate, and then often they do, uh, you know, like a small blood panel. I don't know all the things that they look at, obviously you know, cholesterol, total cholesterol and LDL ratios. I don't know exactly what they're looking at. I'm sure they don't reveal that. But the resting heart rate, the blood pressure, the height and weight, those are really significant factors in terms of, a, you know, likelihood of a person to pass away before age 65, right? So that's why they look at those. And, um, you know, resting heart rate has a very strong association with fitness level. So that is some evidence that you know, getting very physically fit and having really great cardiovascular fitness, um, you know, is associated with a greater lifespan, right? Um, same thing with blood pressure, right? Blood pressure has a very strong, significant correlation with fitness, right? The more fit a person is, the lower their blood pressure, and uh, and that has a really strong correlation. Well, I think it's important to remember that that being really physically fit is not actually expanding your lifespan. Like you're not aging any more quickly or more slowly because of that intervention. What you're doing is is using, you know, fitness is a great prophylactic against heart attacks, strokes, and diabetes, right? So, um, you know, that that's, that's what's cutting people's lifespan short um, more than any other. You know, those three put together are very significant cause of early death so if you eliminate early death but you know vast you know most cases of early death by 
using the greatest prophylactic against that, which is a, you know, a vigorous and very uh, routine, sustainable uh, fitness program, uh, boom, you know, you're, you're going to have uh, much better longevity stats. But you're not going to see, you know, exercise is not going to make you a centenarian if you're above, ha- above average height and weight. Right, above average height and weight, you're just you're just not going to see centenarians with above average height and weight. So, um, yeah, those life insurance companies are looking at blood pressure, resting heart rate, BMI, and uh, doing some basic basic calculations. Now, there's a tremendous amount of individual variability, which they don't account for too much of that. I wouldn't imagine they're probably just looking at uh, you know statistically, st- you know statistical likelihoods and probabilities, right, when they determine you know, the risk of insuring you and, and what your rate is going to be. Um, so yeah, anyway, fitness is my number one priority for, you know, my family and I. We're taking it very seriously and I uh, have a lot of thoughts to share about it. Um, you know, after a decade of suffering from chronic fatigue, uh, my wife getting two knee surgeries and not being able to really walk uh, for multiple years, <laughs> you know, uh, and then just living in Florida where it's completely flat. Uh, you know, I come from an area in the mountains where people were out, you know, doing various forms of recreation for fitness. You know, it was something people did for fun. Um, you know, the average exercise session was probably five, six hours, uh, whether it's skiing, hiking, climbing, mountain biking, rafting, canoeing, kayaking. You know, all those activities are, uh, you know, you don't just do it for half an hour and call it good. <clears throat> you know, these uh, these will get you extremely fit because you're doing it for enjoyment's sake. And that kind of brings me to the topic of, of seeing thumbnails of like Peter Attia and he's got, uh, you know, fucking like oxygen tubes attached to his face to do his, uh, to do his exercise to try to get his VO2 max up. Um, you know, you're... Your typical health guru is an absolute health obsessive, right? And it really takes a health obsessive to, like, get on a piece of exercise equipment and, like, track it over months and years to try to, like, hit new PRs and, you know, almost training like a professional athlete or something like that. Uh, It takes a, a level of interest and dedication that the average person doesn't have at all. And, um... You know, if you look at the fittest people in the area where I grew up, which also happens to be the state with <laughs> the lowest obesity rate, um, and the counties that I lived in in particular, which happen to be the three counties with the highest life expectancy of any counties in the U.S., hint, hint, um, you know, people are out doing uh, physical activity for pleasure. You know, it's completely for pleasure. It's not some scientific thing with a fucking hose attached to your face. You know, it's, uh, you know, you're out doing it for pure enjoyment. You know, you shouldn't have to force yourself to be physically active. Um, You know, people who are really physically fit and carry that into old age and have a high degree of functionality and uh, an extended lifespan based on the fact that, you know, there's no early death from various, like, common chronic illnesses because of that fitness, uh, they're not obsessed with health. They're obsessed with tennis. So they're obsessed with surfing. They're obsessed with hiking. They're obsessed with skiing. They're obsessed with biking. Um, you know, they, they love their outdoor activities or just whatever the activities may be, um, sports and, um, you know, uh, just various hobbies. And, and that's really the, the key for the vast majority of people to have a sustainable long-term fitness routine that that keeps them uh, super fit and uh, keeps them, you know, not completely immune, but certainly statistically uh, much more likely to avoid those common causes of early death that uh, that are keeping people from reaching their maximum lifespan. So, uh, yeah, which is determined by your height, <laughs> mostly, right? So anyway, um, yeah, that's just kind of uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, VO2 max, not a good predictor of lifespan. You really got to, you know, you got to you got to remove the factor that you can't control as much, um, which is, you know, your height, which also affects your weight. Uh, you can't control that as much. And, um, you know, we already know that that, you know, weight and resting heart rate, which is associated with fitness and blood pressure and you know, all these indicators of strong level of fitness, we already know that those have 
significant impact on your your lifespan and uh, significant impact on your your likelihood of dying at an early age from one of those common causes of death. So uh, you don't need to attach a hook, you know, a, a tube to your face or get too uh, you know nerdy about uh, that specifically. You know, that screams marketing gimmick, if anything. Uh, you know, just find something you love and uh, see if you can get fitter. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying it. It's not easy. Uh, and it's easy to make a lot of mistakes, especially if you are like me, who's kind of a natural health, health obsessive. It's easy to like get on to something because you, you know, your mind tells you it's like the scientific best thing to do. And um, those are really sustainable to do that because they're a lot of times they're just inherently unenjoyably like unenjoyable. There, there's no intrinsic pleasure derived from getting on a stationary piece of it, uh, you know, equipment and uh, tracking your heart rate and doing all these things. Uh, you know, it, it's better than nothing, probably. Um, but more often than not, it's just going to lead to boredom and burnout and. Um, I think the worst thing you can do, and I'm a testament to this, is, is, you know, exercise for a few months, uh, and then get bored and burn out, and then stop for a long period of time. That period of like, you know, lots of exercise, none, lots of exercise, none. That's much worse than just doing like, you know, a real minimal workout or something that you do daily. Um, even just going on like a walk for 30 minutes is going to be better than than you know training like you're a pro athlete or something for a few months and then achieving high level of burnout and boredom and quitting and uh i'll talk about that sometime in the future uh you know i was hiking for over a thousand miles every year in my 20s and getting progressively less fit right because every october i would be in like extreme fitness level but then I wouldn't be able to keep up with what made me so fit, which was being out hiking for like five or six hours a day, like five or six days a week. Um, I couldn't keep up with that. And by May, when the hiking season came back around again, I was usually in a little bit worse shape than I was the year before. So, um, you know, even that much exercise was not making me fitter. Um, you know, sustainability and doing something, you know, over the long haul consistency you know consistently I uh, can't speak well um, <laughs> I've been speaking too much Spanish I have a video coming out in Spanish soon I think my English is starting to suffer but um, yeah doing something consistently even if it's something small is much better than than you know even doing the, the massive amounts of exercise and ex I, like I said I had like extreme levels of fitness by the by October and uh, it just goes so quickly when uh, you know you stop and you don't keep up with it so consistency is key and uh, yeah I don't know I'm starting to ramble on a little bit but uh, yeah the vo2 max thing is not total bullshit but um, you know it's just eh, it's silly and I had to say something about it because I don't like silliness